Friends Podcast. Hi, I'm Diane Hunt. I'm an impressionist realist painter connecting with nature through my brush. I work in oil paint and watercolor and I live in the countryside of Maryland's eastern shore, not far from the Chesapeake Bay. You can find me online at dianehuntstudio.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Diane Hunt Studio. Hi, I'm Constance Brosson of Steve Brosson's Jewelry Designs. I live in Oklahoma on a prairie, and I make uh, handmade jewelry in silver, copper, and brass. I'm an artist that paints. I paint pastels and in oil sometimes. Hello, this is Clyde JKL. I'm the host of this podcast. I am a emerging representational artist. I do historic rend- renderings, seascapes, landscapes, volcanicals, birds, and whatnot. With a tight illustrative hand in watercolor, tin and ink, and acrylic paints. And I live in Oklahoma City. And here we are. It is Monday, November the 18th. This is Clyde J. Kell, and you're listening to the Artist Friends Podcast, episode 22. And tonight I'm here with Diane. Constance had a pre- previous appointment, so she couldn't make it. Hello, Diane. Hi, Clyde. Hey, everybody. And it's just the two of us tonight. So it's probably be a little bit of a shortened session. We've got some interesting things to talk about. Um, one of the recommended videos, Diane, did you get a chance to watch the uh, Sergio Gomez on the, how you determine success in your art career? Yeah, I, I listened to that. Um, it's kind of, sometimes you think it's, you know, monetary when you need the money to pay bills. <laughs> and other times it's, um, yeah, more that you're actually painting or creating what you want to create without worrying about having to sell something. So I think it's kind of a cross for me, it's kind of a cross between the two, I guess. Um, yeah. Sometimes you just have to do stuff because you know, it's going to sell and you, cause you got bills to pay and you know, you got, yeah, you're hungry <laughs> or whatever. You need money to buy food and things, but um, you know, it's, so it's kind of a little bit of that. and and also being able to paint whatever I want to paint and not worry about having to sell it. So it's kind of a mixture of the two. Yeah. My, my definition of success is very much the same thing. I do have some monetary concerns, but not, not that much because for me personally, there's only two people in this world that I have to satisfy. And that's my two daughters. (laughs) They're the ones who encourage me and inspire me to uh, start this art career because I've always been been an artist. I've always been able to uh, paint and create artwork, but I never uh, considered it as a profession until this this past three years. So as far as uh, successful career achievements, it's uh, being able to uh, achieve a certain level of skill, you know, always improving. That's very important to me. Sell some work once in a while. Sell, you know, sell, uh, you know, do some commissions. That uh, That's satisfying that you can do something that's very personal to somebody. Like, you know, my pet portraits, they uh, seem to uh, really, uh, at least my, my clients have uh, enjoyed them. And it warms my heart that uh, something that I've uh, created uh, they're going to hold dear. So that's, that to me 
if I can continue doing that, that's successful. But uh, also being able to just create the kind of art and the type of art that I want to without any concern of what anybody else may think, except my two daughters. I value <laughs> their criticism. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think, I think having, creating things that create an impact with people is important too. I mean, I think about like all the artwork I create, it's all geared towards nature and trying to help people um, make that connection with nature so that we do take better care of the world we live in. And I think that's that is an important thing for me too, and and as well as getting better every time I do another painting. So have you? Um, so do you feel successful? Do you feel like you're a successful artist? Um, on some levels, <laughs> but I I'm like I don't know if I'll ever feel like I am totally because I'm always striving to get better and striving to make more of an impact and. You know, it's, I, I don't know if you ever get to the point where you feel totally successful like that. Like, I think, because you have to keep striving. It's like, yeah. you know, if, if you don't do that, then you kind of stagnate. And I think that would not be a good thing. So I think, um, yeah, yeah so I don't know if I'd ever be, like, totally satisfied. <laughs> so I'll you, probably if, if you never be. You, if you call yourself an artist, yeah, you got to continue, you know. yeah. yeah. I guess the the the, the thing that uh, was Sergio, you know, made a comment. He says, is, "Don't let it uh, hinder you. If you are not achieving that success, then uh, don't let it uh, uh, stop you. Because some people get it said and uh, get extremely frustrated. And he said artists especially seem to be really sensitive to criticism, and they listen to they." Too often they listen to too many other people that are not necessarily giving them good advice, and they try to uh, uh, either create art or try to run their career to uh, appease and to make other people happy. And in the in the end, they hurt themselves. Uh, did you catch that when we? When we he, yeah, I don't. I mean, there's some validity, I guess, in trying in people when they give you, like, when you have a critique done on your work. But you have to kind of take what they say with a grain of salt. I mean, you can't let that stop you from creating and um, take it so to heart that you <laughs> you like want to crawl up in a corner and die. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, it's only one person's opinion, and it's you know, might not be, you know, all that valid. I mean, it's, well, I don't, I so don't it's, I, I think as long as I'm feeling like I'm improving and doing, you know, accomplishing what I want to be, what I want to accomplish with my work, I think that's successful. So, you know, whether somebody else likes it or not, that's kind of irrelevant <laughs> yeah. to me. Well, that's like, uh, I, I think, uh, so Sergio was more as talking about like family members or friends rather than a professional critique, a professional critique. Like you said, that's a whole different uh, category. There was a video once that um, I don't know if I recommend it or not. I watch a lot of Stefan Bauman, you know, videos on YouTube and I learned so much from, from that fellow from just his YouTube videos. You know, um, he was talking about a uh, plain air convention and talking about critiques and he had seen uh, where he actually saw artists who they received a professional critique and they were in tears and they were throwing their paintings <laughs> in the car and they were going to give up. They were going to quit. Yeah. And he talked to him and he explained, you know, that maybe the, the uh, so-called professionals doing a critique did not take in consideration. They didn't know the artists. They didn't know at what level in their career or what level in their skill they were at. Therefore, sometimes you don't need to tell somebody everything that they're doing wrong because you're crush them. You know, you're and and uh, some people who 
perform so-called professional critiques uh, don't are not very good at it. In other words, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I mean, it is their opinion, so it's like you know, and they have. I mean, when they do professional critiques, they they usually have some level of um, accomplishment or whatever you want to call it. The support you know, as, at least, you know. But even then, it's like, you know, it's still their opinion. I mean, when I was in art school, we had critiques all the time. It was every day. So it was, <laughs> you know. So you got you used to that, yeah. Yeah, you can't let it get to you, and you get a thick skin. You don't get so attached to things. Like, you know, it's okay. If it didn't work out, just paint another one. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. it's not, Um, you don't. You know, you can't tie yourself, your emotions and yourself to, well, a, and, and to a single way, work of art. Like The same way goes for uh, applying for, you know, artist calls, answering artist calls, you know, applying for exhibitions, uh, either uh, uh, real or, uh, on, well, I don't know why, online's real too, but I mean, you know, physical exhibitions, uh, local galleries, and or uh, online ex exhibitions. And, you know, some of them, there's you know there's fees some of them rather expensive and others you know fairly economical but uh as an example i've been you know that's a route i've been doing and of maybe 10 you know maybe three i got accepted <laughs> yeah so, i mean so everybody goes through that it's not like so, you, you know, know you know you shouldn't let that you know affect you negatively you know as a negative i mean hey that's a, a opinion it doesn't mean your artwork isn't good it's just that for that particular exhibition the person who had to make that decision said no okay we don't need that yeah yeah and you don't know unless you ask them you really don't know why you your work wasn't accepted it could be that they had, you know, I mean, I do a lot of like wave paintings. It could have, could be they had already had like 15 other people submitting wave paintings and they only wanted two, you know, of yeah. that. And so that, that's all I could take. So you don't know like what, what the reasoning is unless you ask them. A lot of times they will tell you if you ask, if yeah. they remember, you know, some of them, they go through so many hundreds of thousands or thousands of paintings. They might not remember your painting specifically, yeah. so it's. But this all get, all gets around to the uh, determining your own success, determining what is successful, mm -hmm. and not uh, letting the negativity, the negative things like critiques and not being accepted in ex you know exhibitions um, to uh, affect you in a negative manner. That you yeah. Should, uh, you should have your 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 success, what you determine as success in your mind and follow that path. Right? That's yeah. And I mean, if you're, if you're putting your work up for critique, especially from a professional, you, you're asking basically for help. You're not, I mean, and they, and they should be giving you constructive criticism, like, you know, not like just tearing your piece apart and not telling you how to fix it. Like, you know, you want to learn from, what they're saying and and try to um, take some of that in if you can. I mean, that's why you ask them for their opinion, you know, so you can get better. And a lot of times you look at your own stuff and you don't know, like, what's wrong with it. You know, something's not working and you can't figure it out. A lot of times it doesn't even take a professional. They can, you know, somebody else with a fresh view can see it and, tell you well that looks funny right there you know <laughs> they don't know really what why it doesn't look right but they can kind of pinpoint something you're not even seeing because you've been looking at it for so long yep and it's yeah you know, it's i don't know there's a lot of different ways of getting critis criticism and and making it work for you i mean don't you just don't want to um take it so hard that you can't take any you know like try to learn from what they're telling you instead of taking it as a, you know, you're horrible, <laughs> that you're no good and you should just quit right now. <laughs> now speaking of pains and everything, um, you know, last week at the, at the end of our uh, session, you know, we, we, when we get together folks, sometimes, you know, we meet for an hour, 
sometimes an hour and a half and we just start talking about all kinds of things because we don't record the whole session because it would probably be boring too because <laughs> we just you know but um, one thing that we were talking about which i was very interested in was uh oil painting because the last time i personally ever did an oil painting i think i was 17 years old and the reason why i'm not doing oil painting now is because my studio apartment is very small and i would intoxicate myself with the turpentine and the solvent fumes you know and everything and diane brought up something which i didn't even know existed and this is how <laughs> 21st century technology for artists is so great and diane what what were we talking about what was that we were talking about we were talking about using um oil uh, walnut oil based paint instead of um the linseed oil and using not having to use the turpentine to clean things and to or as a medium whichever so there are there are oil paints these days where you that are non-toxic that you can use in smaller spaces that won't kill you <laughs> so i mean i use i'm in a small space too and i use um a walnut oil based paint and I basically clean my brushes with the oil um, when I really need to do a really thorough cleaning and I, I'll, I'll just go outside with you know some kind of turpentine or something and to clean them really well but most of the time I can clean pretty much everything out of them with the oil the walnut oil okay yeah I read afterwards after our discussion I, I searched up on the you know on Google <clears throat> and I read some things about cleaning the brushes with the clean the paint off the brushes with the water and oil and then using uh, dish soap like dawn dish soap mm -hmm. know, follow up with that so uh that uh that appealed to me it really did i said now wait a minute yeah i think for the only thing with washing them with the dawn or you know detergent you're putting water in your brush so you want to make sure you get any of that water out before you use that brush again okay. you know, make sure they're really dry because otherwise you got water in with your oil paint that's not good <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> causes problems <laughs> now the, the the walnut i also read online uh that the the walnuts uh because it's a natural product it can if you leave it sit outside out for a long time uh and not use it it can get rancid on you and then when it gets rancid it has a really horrible smell have you experienced that or i mean what what would be that what what I, I I searched and searched and no all people would say would uh, you know at least red was horrible smell but they wouldn't tell you what they wouldn't describe the smell. <laughs> well, any any oils will get rancid if they sit long enough. I mean, I'm sure you've smelled the the smell of the oil, like any kind of oil, even cooking oil or <laughs> anything. Yeah, it has that off smell. It gets rancid, but. Um, I, don't know, I find I use it fast enough that I I don't have to worry about it. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, the recommendation is if you're not going to use it for a long time, just put it in the refrigerator, and it will mm -hmm. keep. Yeah, you know, that's why I read read that in a couple times. I was like, okay, you know. Yeah, I haven't had that problem though. I, I usually end up using it up pretty quickly. Uh, I mean, they 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 do sell larger quantities of it, and it's probably cheaper to buy it that way. But, um. It goes pretty far, so I mean, I don't. I mean, unless you're painting huge paintings on a lot of paint, I don't. I don't know if you want to buy it by the gallon or whatever. <laughs> but now you buy. Okay, you have the the walnut oil, which is kind of like the linseed oil, and then you have what's it called, the walnut alkyd or alkyd. Yeah. Alkyd, yeah. And that one that for? that dries faster. So I usually use the alkyd when I'm uh, putting down my initial colors, and then I'll switch over to just the walnut oil for the rest of it. For like the for like the under the underpainting, you know. Yeah, for the underpainting, I use the alkyd. Okay. Usually. And how long when when a painting is completed with the with the walnut oil? How long does it take before it's thoroughly dry? It's not that much different than any other, you know, like the linseed oil or anything. It just depends on the colors. I mean, and how thick you paint. I mean, everything depends on that. So it's it can be anywhere from 
you know, three or three months or so. I mean, to the touch, it's usually dry within a week, I guess, most of the time. I don't paint terribly thickly, though, so it just, that kind of depends on how thick you paint I and see. what colors. Some colors take longer to dry than others. So it's, okay. it can vary. All right. And then you said, what, for what, two months, three months? How long before you can varnish? I always wait longer. I, I um, will, you, actually, some people just, they don't varnish. They'll just use the walnut oil, just a final coat of walnut oil on the whole painting. I've heard people do that. I don't do that, but um, I have heard that some people do do that. But I'll usually, once my paintings are dry to the touch, I'll use, usually um, spray them with a retouch varnish and then let them dry thoroughly for like six months or more, <laughs> depending on how thick the paint is, oh. before I put the final varnish on. Okay. All right. Boy, completely different world. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, acrylics, you it know, just I, depends. With acrylics, God, I let my acrylics, you know, usually about 24 hours and then <laughs> already the varnish on, you know? <laughs> Yeah. No, you wouldn't want to do that with oil paint. You'd have a bunch of cracking probably. <laughs> yeah. That's Unless you have really thin coats, but that's, that's even then saying. that's, yeah, the oil that would be, be real soon. It, it's got to be thoroughly dry before you varnish because you, yeah. the oil evaporates kind of like it seeps to the mm -hmm. top and you've got, you know, so uh, that's, that, that's what I've read, you know. Yeah. I mean, even though it's dry to the touch from the outside, you have to let it dry longer because you know, the thickness of the paint, depending on how thick it is, it's not dry inside yet. So you have to let that cure out so you can, before you put the varnish on. And today, you'll have major cracks. <laughs> since I was, you know, thinking about, you know, as, as my, for my new year resolution, I'm going to do an oil painting sometime after the, after the new year. I'm going to order, <laughs> order those M. Graham uh, walnut oil based paints. <clears throat> It'd be interesting, you know, to, to Give it a try. Yep. But um, I was watching a uh, Stefan Bauman video and he was talking about, I can't remember the artist's name, but some artist that he went and uh, he visited his studio because this fellow, what always impressed him was his colors was always so rich, you know, rich and, and, and lucent and, and uh, very luminous and deep, you know, his reds and his blues so he got an opportunity to visit the studio of the artist. The artist had, had passed away. And so his, the, his widow still had several of his paintings. had lots of paintings that were unfinished because it took him forever. In fact, he actually never really intended to complete a, a, a work of art. I wish I could remember this guy's name. But he described how he would paint. He would... Um, put a jetso coat down first and he painted on on wood a masonite you know and then he would put a, a a transparent glaze of like yellow and then let that dry and then spray varnish let that dry and then he would put like his other different color and he put his his main colors let those dry and he would spray varnish and then, and he would build up his, his colors where his glazings were really thick, you know, and he said it actually made his paintings look like television, you know, 3d, it gave a 3d effect, you know, <laughs> rich colors, but he would also, it would take him a year to two years to complete one painting. <laughs> yeah. With that yeah, that's a long time. Yeah, with that process. So he had lots of paintings that were not completed, that were in work in progress, you know, mm -hmm. his, when he passed away and his widow, you know, still had them. And, and But I'm thinking, oh, my God, I just don't have the patience for something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to keep your focus when you're extending work that long. And you, like, I mean, I... It, you you learn you lose um and you have like a passion for the painting you're working on and if it takes too too long you you kind of lose that and you're like on to the next thing yeah, you know you lose so it's, kind of, that's it. yeah. 
and That's you lose problem. your vision for what you're trying to do. My concern, worried about, you know, one reason why I want to go to go to oils is that uh, it's to uh, really experiment with the, uh, the the color to get that rich, thick, you know, color and, and the glazing. You can do glazing with acrylic, but not at the same level that you can with oil paint. So, and and glazing, the glazing technique, uh, I use quite a bit with uh, with my watercolors. So I'm very familiar with how to do the glazing. You know, for our non-artist listeners, um, you hear this often, especially if you watch enough videos or if you read, you know, about art and it talks about glazing. Glazing is a technique that the old masters uh, developed. And instead of putting, like in the case of a watercolor, you put a little bit of color with water, and that would be like a wash, okay? But the glazing is you lay down a, it's a, it's more or less a, tra it's a transparent color. Um, it's actually the paint with a little bit of, wa of water, in the case of watercolors, but the paint itself has a certain transparency to it. You lay that down, and when it dries, you lay another color on top of that. And the color from the bottom comes up through, and it makes a completely different different color, and it adds a luminosity. It just makes the paint a, a certain, what I like to call, you know, pop. It makes it pop. <laughs> it makes the color pop out. With the case of... Uh, uh, with the oils, the old masters would have sometimes anywhere between five, six, maybe as many as 15 different colors that make combined with the glazing on top. And that would, would make the, uh, the final, you know, the final color, which is why some of their, you know, colors are so rich and everything. And you can do that a little bit with acrylic, but it's very, very difficult. But uh, anyhow, so that's my r rationale for wanting to go to oil. But I also, Diane, have the fear that because I really, one reason why I like watercolors and one reason why I like acrylics is that I work fast. And I like, you know, it takes a little the short drying time. <clears throat> I can add the next layer on top and, and go forward. With oils, I know you got to slow down because they – take a while <laughs> and so i'm not so sure you know how i'm going to uh, get back into you know oil any recommendations <laughs> well they do have different dryers and stuff but i'm trying to think i haven't used any of those in a while i don't i can't remember how they smelled like how much um yeah since i want to stay away from the solvent yeah <laughs> How much of that, that not willing, and, and just not toxic willing. fumes and things you'd get from any of that stuff. But yeah, I'm not willing um, to risk that just to, just to, uh, so I can paint fast. Yeah. The alk, the alkyd medium that, that dries fairly quickly. I mean, it's not as quick as, um, the acrylic or the watercolor would have been, would be, but it's, it's fairly quick. I mean, it's, you know, by overnight you it's dry and you can paint it on top of it. Well, another That's technique we, we had talked about is I could lay down, since I could lay the all my base colors, all my underpainting colors down with acrylic mm -hmm. and then have the oil on the top. And I, I'd be, now that's something I'm going probably going to experiment with my first painting is to see see what kind of an effect I can, you know, I can get, you know, and uh, that, that would be, uh, it'd be interesting. Yeah. yeah, it's basically a fat over lean, so you want to start, even with, the, you know, you can do the acrylic, that doesn't have any oil in it, so, but then even when you're painting with the oil, you want to use less oil in the initial layers, and more as you go on, you can get, you know, more and more of the oil in it, so if you do it the other way around, you have, you end up with problems, <laughs> issues, <laughs> Yeah, <clears throat> but. And same way with the thickness of the paint too. You, if you paint thicker, you want to have your initial layers th a thinner paint, and then go thicker as you go on. Okay. Causes right. less causes less issues. <laughs> okay, I think I think we beat we beat that to death. Um, I also mentioned about uh, LinkedIn. You know, updating our LinkedIn and everything, and the rationale for that 
I know we're busy with, you know, social media, you know, as artists, or whatever, but with my own usage of LinkedIn and I followed the recommendations of Stephen Bauman, LinkedIn is where a lot of our collectors and galleries and uh, art creators, you know, the professional people that we want to reach, uh, that's pretty much where they, you know, where they hang out. And by developing uh, followers or making connections on there, it's a numbers game, just like Facebook, just like Twitter, just like Instagram. But the diff difference between LinkedIn and all those others is it seems to be more interactive. At least that's what I've encountered. And uh, so that's when I, with Diane and Constance, I proposed a challenge to them to get their numbers up, you know, and Diane was telling me some of the things she encountered earlier, but <laughs> she's, she's still got to work on it. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just one of those, you know, another thing on my list to, to do when I haven't, don't always have time to do what's on my list already. So it's, it's a little more time consuming, especially I'm, I haven't been on there in a while. So it's trying to, get reacclimated. They've changed a lot of things since I was on there last. So it's yeah, a lot different exactly. than it used to it's, be. It's actually, it's improved quite a bit, but the, the, a lot of the success, success that I've been having, uh, has come from link. Most of it's become, has come from LinkedIn because, um, uh, when I started getting back active with it back in September, I had like something like 80, 80 some, you know, connections followers. Now I'm almost at a thousand. I'm like uh, nine sixty eight or whatever. But when I reached at two hundred was when the interactivity really started. Uh, it's like it it accelerated with people asking me to accept them as you know as a friend. And there's there's artists. There's a combination. There's artists. There's galleries. There's curators. And then I started receiving emails. Like, you know, I think in the past I've, you know, uh, received an email for an invitation, you know, to uh, participate in some uh, exhibitions in, in Italy. And, of course, if it was online, digital, fine. But a couple of them were not. They were actual galleries, and I just didn't have the money to send their artwork over there. But these all came from LinkedIn, which is what amazed me, you know. And so it has some definite value to, to build up the, uh, the connections, you know, and their interactivity too. I mean, you know, uh, comment on other postings and you know, Gary Vaynerchuk talks about that quite a bit. You know, he says, you, you've got to, you know, he talks about, uh, creating media. Well, if you, if you're not in a way to create media, then the next step is the interactive you know, on all the social media platforms, you know, and everything. So, um, yeah, it takes time. Yeah. It, <laughs> it's frustrating, but we need to work it into our routine, into our, our routine and, and consider it a, a necessary, uh, process. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I think what hold me back mostly is I don't have time to sit at the computer very much. So I think I'm what I'll have to do is um, see about getting the uh, app on my phone for it, so that I can do it on the go. <laughs> yeah, have a little more access to it that way. Yeah, I, I've got to admit, I on all of these <clears throat> platforms, I'm more computer or, oriented. I have the apps on the phone. But my phone is so pitiful. Oh, big! What a problem is my fat fingers. <laughs> I just don't type too well on the phone, <laughs> so I'm not as as active on the phone. And uh, but on the computer, hey, of course it's that's my routine. You know. Well, have you got any any announcements for this week? I think we're going to wrap this episode up. Um, not that I can think of. Nope. All right. <laughs> okay. We uh, will be meeting next week, and of course, next week will be Thanksgiving. So, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, it's here already. <laughs> yeah, <I> no, <know. laughs> that means the year is coming to a close. So it's going to be time to set ourselves some new goals and and <laughs> uh. yeah, <laughs> come on. <laughs> 
Uh, I know all the time. Like, but hey, you know that's what this is all about, right? You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Keep, keep her going. Well, we have to go back through our list from what we had set for the year for this year and see what we've <laughs> yeah. accomplished and what we haven't. And, yeah. <laughs> On one, like everybody else, that set new list of things we want to accomplish. Yep. Exactly. You know and. Uh, you know, some things I feel good about, other things uh, I don't feel so Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it goes. Can't do everything, but we okay. try. Constance, Constance do as much as we can. Constance promised she'll be back with us next week, so we're, we'll hear what the, <clears throat> the adventures. I, that's a, That'd be a whole new podcast, The Adventures of Constance. <laughs> she has so many unique adventures. She keeps us laughing, folks. We don't record even – half of the things that she says <laughs> she, keeps, she keeps us going so we miss her we miss you constance i know you're going to be listening <laughs> so this is clyde jkl and you've been listening to the artist friends podcast november the 18th episode 22 and i'm with diane i want to say goodbye to everybody bye bye diane thank you so much for joining me and keeping me company bye clyde bye everyone all right Bye-bye, folks. Thanks for listening. The Artist Friends Podcast is produced and edited by Clyde J. Kell. Participating artists, Diane Hunt and Clyde J. Kell. You can find more information about Diane Hunt at www.dianehuntstudio.com. Clyde J. Kell at www.cjklartworks.com. If you'd like to participate or appear as a guest on the Artist Friends Podcast, please email cjkl at sign mystery-otr.com. That's cjkl at sign mystery-otr.com. This podcast is issued under the Creative Commons License 2019. Thank you for listening. Thank you.